Welcome to this uh, webinar on getting started using the four uh, national cohort studies. Uh, we manage here at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies and uh, thank you all for, for coming and being interested and we're really excited to introduce you um, to these cohort studies. So um, I'd like to start with a bit of housekeeping. Hopefully um, this is all uh, muted, but if you can keep your cameras off and mics muted at all times. Um, if you have any questions, if you could please use the, the chat function and um, note that your questions will actually, they'll be, a vis they'll be visible to all attendees. Um, just to say, we're, uh, if you have any technical issues, please email us at ioe.clsevents at ucl.ac.uk. Um, we're also recording the event um, and the content section of the webinar, but not the questions, uh, will be available at a later date. Um, and last but not least, um, feedback is really important to us as we're putting together um, training uh, continually uh, and trying to improve our training to help researchers use the cohort data. So um, if you could complete the very short feedback form at the end, the link will appear nearer at the end of the webinar. Uh, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, today's schedule uh, with approximate timings. Um, so it's split into sessions. So the first one is the introduction, um, which I'm going to do. And I'm Vanessa Moulton. I'm a researcher at CLS and I'm kicking off uh, to giving an overview of cohorts, what they are, and broadly the type of information that's collected. Um, we then have Morag Henderson, who's uh, the principal investigator on one of our cohorts, Next Steps, and she's going to talk about the types of content we have by um, some, uh, but not all our subject areas. And then Richard um, Silverwood, who's um, chief statistician here, is going to give an overview of the type of analysis that you might be, be able to do. And then back to me with um, tips on getting started, and then we'll finish with, um, finish with some questions. So, uh, what are cohort studies? Well, uh, they're a type of longitudinal study that follow participants over, uh, over a period of time. Uh, they're different from longitudinal studies in that participants share a common characteristic. So this could be, uh, for example, age, it could be a particular occupation, it could be um, a type of disease, for example. And what distinguishes birth cohorts is that they follow people in a particular period of time. So um, it could be people who were born on a particular day or a particular week or a year, um, for example. Um, and birth cohorts follow these people throughout their lives and collect information at particular ages. Um, and they're also often referred to as uh, prospective um, studies. So across their lives, we don't know, we don't know what will happen to them. Um, they will ex be exposed to specific risk factors or characteristics. And by measuring um, outcomes over a period of time, it is then possible to then explore the impact of, of that particular factor or variable. So since individuals are followed longitudinally across their lifespan from birth or even uh, in some cohorts from pregnancy, um, birth cohorts allow us to delineate um, associations between early exposures and subsequent outcomes. So you can look at outcomes at different points in the life cycle. Um, so, for example, in childhood, um, in adolescence, adulthood, midlife and beyond. And then you can use the prospective information that's been collected to look at risks and exposures early in life, as well as being able to control for a large number of factors um, in your analysis, which we've collected. Another major advantage is temporal sequence. So you can see, um, you can use early events and characteristics, um, things that you know that came first to investigate uh, later outcomes. And I think this is something that um, Richard will, will cover a bit more um, in the analysis section. So another feature of our birth cohorts is um, the period that they grew up in. So uh, this slide um, shows some of the cohorts housed at uh, UCL um, and also within the Centre for Longitudinal Studies. Um, so what was the historical context when they were born? Um, and then what was the historical context during their childhood, during adulthood and beyond? So, for example, um, there are differences for the cohorts in terms of education. Um, the education leaving age, for example, 
um, for the 1958 cohort had just changed to 16. So they had to stay in school until they were 16. Um, and now for the Millennium Cohort Study, um, they have to stay in um, statutory education until 18. Um, there are more opportunities now for further education um, since the 1990s, um, and this is an increase for all. And there are so many factors that could, inf as we know, if, if, um, impact on people's lives. So as well as social and cultural changes, um, there was the rise of individualis individualisms uh, during the 80s, uh, demise of manufacturing in the 70s, increasing in the service sector, uh, various recessions at different points, um, scientific advances, technological changes, health improvements, globalization, and more recently, things like the cost of living, the environment, and, and obviously the wars um, currently going on in Europe and in the Middle East, which, which are um, impacting on, on our lives and on our cohort lives, cohorts' lives. So to give you an example, um, obviously an, an obvious one is, is COVID-19. So we didn't, it's, not, it's something we didn't expect, it was um, a sudden health um, as well as an economic shock, but each cohort experienced the COVID pandemic and sub subsequent events, but its influence will be more or less um, or to a lesser or greater extent, firstly related to perhaps their age. So depending on whether you were in a cohort born in 1958 or in 2000, you, it might be, have a different impact in terms of health, um, their education or their jobs, for instance, but also their individual characteristics and things that have happened to them in their past their past experiences. So the cohort, cohorts have a wealth of information which been, has been collected prior to the event. Um, unlike most studies which have, um, for example, in terms of COVID, have had to collect the information retrospectively. And soon, um, with new data collections, we'll be able to also look at things like the impact of, of COVID and the cost of living crisis on, on later outcomes. So I'm sorry, there's quite a lot of text on this slide, but um, we wanted to, um, before we focus on the established um, cohorts at CLS, we wanted to draw your attention to our new studies. So the first um, is the Early Life Cohort Feasibility Study, which is following a cohort of several thousand babies born in the UK in 2022. And this will um, hopefully provide insights into the health and development of children, and there's data expected for that um, in late uh, 2024. Uh, the children of the 2020 study, um, and this is a study of babies born in Eng England in the autumn of 2021 and covers family, early education and childcare, uh, as well as determinants of early school success, um, and hopefully to answer important scientific and policy questions. Um, wave one, uh, nine months, that's complete, and wave two at two years is underway. Um, and finally, the COVID social mobility and opportunity study began in 2021. Uh, and it follows over 13,000 young people who were in year 11 at the time it's the survey started and focuses on the effects of COVID-19 pandemic and the cost of living on young people's lives and prospects. And there are already two waves of this data um, available for you to, to use. So more specifically, um, today, the four cohorts we're looking at are the National Child Development Study, who were uh, born uh, in the same week in Great Britain, so that's Scotland, in, um, England, Scotland and Wales in the same week, uh, and the initial sample was um, 17,500. Uh, the second is the BCS 70, again born in the same week in um, in Great, not in the same week as the, the 1958, but born in one week in, in Great Britain, around, uh, there was around 17,000 of those. Um, Next Steps, which is a slightly different from the other three in that um, the study began when they were aged 13 to 14 and was initially run by the Department for Education up to age 20. Um, and it's England only and has just under 16,000 participants. And then finally, the Millennium Cohort, Cohort Study, who were born in the UK from 2000 to 2002 and has around 19,000 particip 19, participants. All these studies are ongoing, and this chart shows the year on the horizontal and the age on the vertical, um, and the dots refer to periods of data collection. So the oldest cohort we run, as I mentioned, is the, the 1958. And since they were been born, there's been 10 data collections, excluding the COVID surveys, um, and the last available collection was at age 55. The BCS 70, so they since 1970 when they were born, nine data collections um, have periods have been uh, happened, and the last was age 46. 
Next steps, so from 2004 inclusive, data was collected every year for seven years uh, in all until they were age 20, and then the last week was when they were 25. And finally, the Millennium Cohort Study, including the first data collection at nine months, have seven sweeps, uh, the last at age 17. Um, and just to say that uh, mid to later next year, new data will be available for three of our cohorts. So the um, NCDES, eight, well, they'll, they'll be aged 62 to 65. The BCS 70, who will be aged 52 to 53, and next steps around age 33. And the new sweep of the Millennium Cohort Study is currently in the field, um, and they're around age 22 to 23. So, a vast amount of information has been collected about the cohort members across the life course. It's multidisciplinary, spans social, economic, psychological and health data. Um, similar information has been collected in each of the studies, as well as additional information which is more specific to each of the cohorts. Um, so there's various information which, which Morag will go into in a, a bit more detail, um, but uh, there's information about the cohort members' parents, um, details on the birth, health issues, uh, the circumstances that they grew up in, schooling, transitions from education to employment, relationships and parenthood, um, and then measures over time, so things like mental health, uh, physical measurements that have been measured at, at most sweeps, um, health data including biomarkers, um, and more ag will cover, as I mentioned, some of this uh, in a bit more detail in a few moments. So the information has been collected using different approaches and asked of different reporters. So this is an example from the uh, NCDS 1958 cohort. Um, so information has been gathered from the parents about themselves, the household and the cohort member. And as the cohort members grow, um, grow older, they start completing um, the surveys themselves. Um, and also there are other participants. So uh, in this case, um, the schools have given information about the school and the, ch and the children, the cohort members, and also um, as, as the co cohort members have got older, we've um, done um, surveys with children of the cohort members. There are different modes of collection, so face-to-face -face interviews, self-completion, online questionnaires, there's different types of assessments. Um, so for example, cogn cognitive measures, uh, physical, physical assessments, time use records, um, biomedical sweeps, um, and then things like um, anthropology, I knew I shouldn't have attempted to say this, anthropometry, uh, physical function, blood pressure and blood samples, um, and also consent for various um, record linkage. So other data enhancements in the birth cohorts, just to quickly cover um, those. Um, so as I mentioned, we have genetic data in three of our three of our cohorts. Um, and in the MCS, MCS uh, there are um, but genetic data, a trio of genetic data has been collected for cohort members, biological mother and biological father. There's also linked health and educational data. There's consent for employment uh, and crime data in the, the uh, younger cohorts. Uh, there's geographical data which is available, for example, uh, on local output areas and points of, um, points of interest. Um, and these resources are continually being added to. Um, but just to let you know, this data is more sensitive and possibly disclosive, so access to those specific, specific things takes a bit longer. Um, if you're looking at cross-cohort analysis, there's some data that's been harmonised across different cohorts, for example, socioeconomic, BMI, mental health, etc. Uh, and this is also an, a key area of expansion. Uh, and I, as I've mentioned, COVID-19, we also have uh, COVID online surveys in each of the cohorts. Uh, covering where possible uh, the same content. Uh, the first survey was in uh, during the first national lockdown, the second um, when restrictions have been eased and then and then the third during the third national lockdown and there was also a serology study uh, where we got blood samples to conduct antibody tests and the surveys investigate possible impacts of the pandemic on multiple aspects of life and covered a wide range of subjects. Um, so that's a very uh, brief overview, so thank you, uh, and I'll move on to Morag now, who's going to talk about the content. Thank you, Vanessa. Let me just share my screen. And I'll just ask Vanessa if you could confirm one segment that you could see the screen, but not my notes. That's perfect. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Lovely. 
Um, hi everyone. So as Vanessa said, I'm Morag Henderson. I'm actually the director of the Next Step study, so I have a slightly vested interest in that little study. Uh, but I'm here today to talk to you about the sort of subjects, themes or disciplines that we cover in a bit more detail. Um, it's by no means exhaustive or extensive. Uh, this is a very short section of a very small webinar and there are other resources that will we'll point you to towards the end of the webinar if you wanted to find out more information. And of course, we're here to answer questions, so please do keep questions coming into the chat, which we'll answer at the end of the, the webinar. Um, so um, you will notice as I take you through these resources that there are some differences in the ages of the sweeps across cohort and the content of the sweep. And it's partly just to offer an explanation that the measures included in each of the sweep reflect the age appropriate questions. Uh, the best measurement from the evidence at the time and also perhaps funders priorities. So there's a constant tension that we have to kind of navigate at CLS um, between the data collection to be suitable for within sweep and over time and between cohort comparisons. So you will see that tension reflected here. <clears throat> and I would say increasingly that CLS has a commitment to harmonisation. Some of the work that Vanessa mentioned touches on that, but the work as well that uh, we did during the COVID-19 web surveys and the newer sweeps of the data collections are, are really are trying to reflect this. So the subject areas I'm going to take you through in the next uh, 20 minutes or so are these. Um, again, it's not an exhaustive or extensive list. Uh, it's just to give you a kind of wet your appetite of the kind of areas that we cover and the different measurements that we include. Uh, so these are the five areas. And you might want to think about these as uh, either your main explanatory variable of interest or the main dependent variable of interest. So we could think about um, the association between, let's say, mental health and educational attainment. So two of the domains that are covered here. So just bear that in mind as we go through. Um, the typical pieces of information that we cover are from birth through their education and into adulthood. And under each of these sections, you can see the sort of kinds of information that we've collected. Similar information has been collected where we can across each of the studies, as well as having additional information collected that might be specific to that particular age group or a period cohort. So let me take you to the first uh, sort of scientific theme that we include uh, today. So this is physical health. The origin of the studies varies quite a lot. Um, NCDS was originally a perimetal mortality study and had a strong focus on health. Um, the BCS70 had a similar sort of uh, rationale, so has a strong focus on health and continues to sort of walk very closely in line with the, um, the 1958 study. Next Steps, as Vanessa said, was originally an educational study, and so the early sweeps um, have an abundance of social and economic measures, but little in the way of physical health. Uh, but this has changed a bit more in recent sweeps and will continue to do so as we go through adulthood. Um, and lastly, the MCS, our most recent and youngest cohort, has a strong focus on, on health as well as the social aspect. So physical health is well captured in uh, at least three of the studies. And I'll give you a slide at the end which cites the information that I'm going to show you here. I'm going to show you a lot of these tables, um, so bear with me. I'm going to just spend a little bit explaining the kind of structure of them so it'll help you navigate them later and after the session. We will share the slides after the session, so you can use these for reference going forwards. Essentially, the theme is in the top left hand corner, so physical health measures. We've got the kind of concept or specific variable or measure down the left hand side in that column. And then um, the cohorts are split out from uh, oldest to youngest, from left to right. And within each cell for the, each of the cohorts, you'll see these numbers which denote the age at which the uh, measure or concept appears. So the sweep or the wave or the age that they appear. Um, so these might be more useful after the session, um, so you won't be able to absorb all of this. So this is just a very high level summary of the types of information that we have. So let me just flag a few things from the self-assessed, uh, sorry, from the physical health measures. Um, we have reasonably good coverage of uh, self-assessed general health across, um, across all four of the studies, but more specifically, as I mentioned, the origins of the 58, the 70 and the Millennium cohort study is much more focused on health. So that's reflected in the fact that we have it at multiple ages captured um, across the, the life course. For next steps, we only have it at age 25, but it will be updated with the most recent data. 
Other things we capture, BMI and height. We have um, HES data linkage, so the hospital episode statistics. Um, this captures incidences of hospitalisation for those who consented to that linkage. And we do have a specific uh, webinar video on the CLS webpage that covers this information in a lot more detail. Uh, anthropometry, Vanessa also mentioned, captures objective measures through uh, blood pressure, body fat, grip strength and uh, height and weight, for example. And again, that's captured well across the um, studies that are highlighted as having a strong health focus. And lastly, um, just to show you the sort of aspect of risky behaviours, if you like, or health related behaviours, we do capture drugs and alcohol consumption. But you will also see that there are many, many other um, measures including smoking, long-standing health conditions, diet and physical activity through accelerometry data um, in addition, which captures, we've got accelerometry data for BCS70 and, and the Millennium Cohort Study and that captures time spent sitting, standing, moving or sleeping over a seven day period. The COVID web surveys, as Vanessa mentioned, they were captured at various points throughout the sort of COVID pandemic, and we are we've captured these across all four of our cohorts. And these are some of the specific measures that we included, including um, symptoms, testing, COVID presence, uh, whether um, cohort members experience long COVID, whether they've experienced disruption to medical appointments. Um, in addition, some were asked to provide um, their antibodies so that they were sent a blood sample collection kit and asked to post back. So we're able to identify whether um, our cohort members were exposed to the virus via the sort of uh, antibodies through infection or through uh, vaccination. We also have a lot of self-report um, aspects too that I think are really interesting. So. That is a very much a whistle stop tour to physical health. So you'll get the sense that we're moving quite quickly and we're going to move now to the mental health and well-being aspect. Um, so there are lots of different ways to measure aspects of mental health, uh, mental ill health, mental functioning, well-being. Um, and many of these I've listed here are the symptom driven scales that we use across the cohorts. Um, these are usually sort of screening tools for diagnosis. And they're often selected to be included uh, based on age appropriateness and the best scientific knowledge at the time. So I don't have time to go into um, these scales in very much detail, but just to say I will sort of flag up and talk about the malaise inventory in a little bit more detail, just so that you can see the kinds of information that underlies these measures. And that if you were to work with um, this data, you might uh, need to do a bit more research on. So um, this is the malaise uh, inventory, the nine item malaise inventory. It was devised by the late CLS professor and former director John Binner for use in the questionnaires. The original malaise scale had 24 items, but because of space within the study and time tensions, um, Professor Binner developed this shortened version and, and it was validated and found to provide accurate and consistent measures uh, of psychological distress, both within and between generations, and allowed us to get a better understanding of mental health questions. Um, sorry, um, and a better understanding of, of the measurement of mental health. Essentially, participants were asked to score, um, to, so say yes or no to each of these uh, categories, and they were scored one point if they said yes and zero for every no. Anything that's sort of four or more, is considered uh, to be experiencing some symptoms associated with uh, depression. Um, so again, there's lots of paperwork that underpins this, and the, um, there are many, many uh, measures, again, age appropriate and time appropriate measures across the study. So um, it does require a bit of care and careful reading. But just to show you the sort of coverage that we have, um, again, following that same format as I showed you before, we have the kind of concept down the left hand side or the measurement down the left hand side of which here I flagged malaise, uh, where we can see it's covered well uh, in the older two cohorts, the 1950 and the 1970. And since then, um, the Millennium Cohort Study has captured uh, parent, teacher and self-report um, using the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which uh, it is more age appropriate and as was considered best sort of science at the time. Um, and for next steps, uh, we use uh, the General Health Questionnaire 12, which is used throughout adolescence and into early adulthood. And we can see that that same measure was used in the 1958 and the 1970. So you'll see on this slide that uh, some are in green, some are in blue and some are in orange. And uh, we have the parent report 
both of themselves and of the young person and uh, the teacher report of the young person's mental health so that you can do some quite interesting um, kind of triangulation of, of experiences comparing self-report with um, others reporting aspects of mental health and yeah there is quite a sort of spread here so it does capture um, some of the complexity uh, within mental health. What we've tried to do for the COVID-19 sweeps in addition to asking the sort of specific mental health measure that have been used in the main sweeps of the cohort we also added these two um, scales which allows us to do some harmonization work um, so we can compare uh, concurrent reports of the general health questionnaire with the concurrent reports of the PHQ or the GAD, for example, within next steps. Uh, and then we can use these measures to compare differences across cohort um, and their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the PHQ captures um, depression and then the, uh, the, the GAD captures anxiety. And these are the types of questions that, that are asked. And these are relatively short scale, but allow for harmonization and cross cohort comparison in a relatively straightforward way using the COVID-19 data that we've collected. Moving now then to family and relationships. Um, uh, these are kind of across all cohorts. We measure family relationships, who's in the household. And at most sweeps, we capture um, family change. So we know from the household grid who's in the household, their relationship to the cohort member. We ask participants or parents to report the age and number of siblings. So we have sibship size. Um, we know the sort of legal status of the parents. So whether it's a, they're living with a biological parent plus a step parent or whether they're adoptive or carers. We know from most of the sweeps, uh, sorry, most of the cohorts, the age of the parents when the cohort member was born. There's lots of interesting research about um, age of parents and their ability to uh, and their associated outcomes. Fertility intentions is captured in adulthood, so it's not across every sweep, but it's, it's captured across every cohort. And we also ask questions about pregnancy history. Um, as well as being able to identify that aspect of family change. So are they still married to the same person? Are they still living with the same people? And so we capture sort of instances of cohabitation, marriage, divorce, dissolution, and then possibly reformation. So it's quite a dynamic um, aspect of the data. Um, moving then to education, ability and cognitive measures. This is an outcome that's particularly interesting to me. Um, the education measures are uh, captured at various stages throughout um, uh, the, the young people's educational career and it allows for some cross cohort comparison. So for key stage one to three in next steps in the Millennium Cohort Study, we have objective measures from the National Pupil Database, which is the sort of census for educational attainment. Um, and so we're able to uh, identify their progress at these stages. And then at GCSE or equivalent, we also capture both uh, the objective and subjective um, reporting of the subject studied and the, and the grade. So we can do some quite interesting comparisons there and it allows us to look across uh, generations as well. We've got lots about study intentions, aspirations. We have um, linked data to the individualized learning record for next steps. And um, for higher education, we capture degree subject, university type and degree grade for um, the oldest three cohorts. And for the Millennium Cohort Study, which, as Vanessa said, is currently in the field, we'll be able to get an update on their progress, what their, whether they graduated, what their sub, uh, grade was, the subject was and um, the, uh, sort of the, the, the degree, overall degree mark. So educational attainment is one part of it. We also have uh, measures of cognitive ability. Um, it's not just in childhood, but we look at it across the life course and I'll say a little bit more about that. But these are some of the different uh, measures um, that we include. These are sort of well validated and renowned tests um, such as the British Academy skills or the Bracken school readiness test, as well as um, sort of specific do domains that they're testing. Excuse me. Um, we're also asking participants to sort of demonstrate their abilities in verbal and math tests. Um, so we can compare these sort of cognitive abilities with their formal educational attainment, for example. And as we as the cohort members age into adulthood, we start to move more towards 
numeracy and literacy and capturing cognitive functioning. So focusing on things like memory, working memory and whether or not we can establish changes uh, across the life course, in particular cognitive decline. So there are a few tests that are repeated across and within cohorts, and I'll just show you them here. Uh, this captures the sort of main skill measured on the left hand side um, and the, um, the age at which they're measured across cohort. So it's useful thinking a bit about some of these. So even the mathematics and numeracy tests, numeracy tests will include some aspects of verbal skill because of the need to understand instructions. And the one that I've highlighted here is the verbal skills, which featured across three or four cohorts. Some sweeps have separate tests measuring verbal skills, for example, a reading or a language comprehension, a spelling or a word definition test, and others it's, it's embedded within the, the self-completion part of the survey itself. Um, so the last section we're going to look at is looking at earnings and income. Uh, just to give a brief definition, earnings are money obtained in return for labour or services, so that includes wages from a, from a job. Income, on the other hand, is a bit more broad. It will also include um, money from uh, from work, but in addition to that, some investments, income support or other benefits. Wealth, on the other hand, is an accumulation of all of the economic resources that can either be measured in either real goods or value for money or, sorry, or money value. So earnings are relatively well captured, both for the cohort member as they are in the labour market and aged into the labour market and for the parents. So we can look at some intergenerational earning mobility um, or income mobility. And uh, that's, as I say, relatively well captured. And once we have updates from next steps at age 32 or three or MCS at age 22 or 23, we'll be able to see how they fare on the labour market for many. Occupational status, sort of job type, job description. Uh, is also included in, in the data and relatively well captured using the socks and SIC codes, so social class and, and uh, um, sort of industry of, of the, the, the role that they work in. And it does allow for that generational analysis, as I said. So wealth is a bit patchy, I would say, in our studies, and that's something I think we're looking to improve upon. But um, we have housing wealth, uh, so value of property, we have saving for sorry for it, the 1958 and the 1970 we have savings relatively well captured for three of the four of the cohorts and we have debt captured uh, relatively well for a different three of the other uh, cohorts so uh, it's something i think we need to look at to try to improve but we do have a lot on, in terms of um, earnings income and occupation to compensate but that's some wealth is something we need to address i think so so that was just five topics. So I appreciate you might be sitting thinking, oh, but that's not, you've not covered any of the things I'm interested in. So I'll just give you a quick overview before I hand over to Richard about how to search um, these resources. One way is to use Closer Discovery. This is a, a sort of search platform that uh, not only includes our CLS cohort studies, but lots of the data that you might be interested in using. And here I've just put in the search terms life satisfaction. I can select uh, a specific age or period in a person's life to sort of to minimise the number of hits I get, or I can search in particular a study. So I could se select on the Millennium Cohort Study life satisfaction, and it would give me only those results. So here I think I've selected on uh, BCS 70 life satisfaction, I've got eight results, and the results will show me the variable name, the age at which the um, uh, the question was asked, and it will also document the actual question and some of the frequencies. So I think it's a pretty good starting point. The thing to be careful of is not all sweeps are currently available, so it's a resource that's continually being updated. Um, so don't. it could be a useful first port of call, but don't stop there if you still haven't found what you're looking for. Alternative approaches or additional approaches is to download the questionnaires from either the CLS website or the UK Data Service and search through the PDFs of those for particular keywords or questions. Or you might download the actual data from the UK Data Service and Vanessa will explain the process of that, but searching through the variable list um, in that way, or there are some data dictionaries available on the CLS website. The other way is to look at the descriptions of the variables that are in already published papers. 
Um, I mentioned uh, just this is the link to the other training resources that we have at CLS. So there are some themes in focus. We've currently got a mental health theme that goes into a lot more detail than I've been able to today about the measures and contents and frequency of measures across all four of the cohort studies. And there's also one on biomedical um, data and also one on care in the cohorts. And that's a resource that we're continuing to populate. So please do keep it keep an eye on that web page. And there are upcoming events, that again, we'll mention a little bit later. So thank you. Um, this is just a slide that has some of the citations. And Richard, I will hand over to you, who's going to take you through some of the research analysis opportunities using this data. Great, thank you very much. OK, hopefully you can all see my slides there. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Richard Silverwood. I'm uh, an associate professor of statistics at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies. Great to see so many people interested in finding out more about the data that we have in these cohorts. Um, so you've already heard quite a bit about the, the different types of data that we have. Uh, and um, the idea of, of this session that I'm going to give over about the next 20 minutes is um, to think about uh, in particular some of the particular features of the cohort data and how you can use those in the sorts of analyses that you might wish to undertake. Um, so as you've seen we've got lots and lots of data so that lends itself to um, potentially quite complex analyses but I'm going to start with some very simple types of analyses and then move on and think about some of those slightly more complex analyses that you might want to undertake. So I think the, the simplest sort of analysis that you might wish to take in, in perhaps any data set is taking a, a single variable or perhaps a single derived variable uh, and thinking about calculating a mean or calculating a prevalence of, or something. Um, so this isn't something that perhaps we do all the time, but there's um, some examples of this and the example that um, is a particularly important recent one over the last few years uh, is some of the the data that we collected uh, on COVID-19 and some of the initial analyses that we did using those data so obviously a little bit out of date now but at this point in time it was a very important findings that we were able to produce quite quickly with the data that we we'd collected um, and so as I'm going through I'm going to be presenting some results from um, different publications uh, and so this is based on some initial findings that we published at the time. So one question that we might want to address is what's the prevalence of test confirmed COVID-19 and we're looking at this uh, across the different cohorts that we have uh, and there's a couple of questions that we can use to derive this. Have you been tested for coronavirus? Yes or no? And what was the result of your test? Positive, negative, etc. So from this we can derive a, a binary variable for test confirmed COVID-19. We can calculate the percentage of individuals who report having test confirmed COVID-19, sorry, um, and also uh, calculate a 95% confidence interval for that. And you can see that's what we've presented here on the right hand side in a table form. And you'll see that there's uh, the fifth study included here is the NSHD National Survey of Health and Development, which is another birth cohort based uh, in a different part of UCL, born in 1946. You'll, you'll see that that uh, additional um, cohort does crop up in some of the analyses that I'll be presenting. Um, I won't dwell too much on interpreting each of the individual analyses. Really, the, the point of this is just to illustrate some of the um, different analyses that you might want to undertake. So a diff slightly different question. Uh, what's the prevalence of self-reported COVID-19 in each cohort? Again, we had a, a question that was directly addressing this. Do you think that you've, you have or have had uh, coronavirus? Similar thing we've um, calculated on the basis of that question, the percentage of individuals within each cohort uh, who were reporting that variable, uh, constructed a 95% confidence interval, and here we're presenting those results graphically. So those are the simplest sorts of analyses. We might want to go slightly further, thinking about asking, answering questions such as, does the prevalence of self-reported COVID-19 differ between males and females in each cohort? So here we've taken the same variable from the previous slide and just calculated the prevalence uh, in males and females separately. So in MCS, we can see that in males, the prevalence was 4.9%. In females, the prevalence was 6.5%. So we could stop there with a more descriptive comparison 
comparison of those percentages, but here we've gone slightly further and, and calculated uh, a relative measure. So here a risk ratio for MCS of 1.45, suggesting that the risk among females was 45% greater than among males. So that sort of um, analysis where we're thinking more about associations perhaps brings us neatly on to the next thing I wanted to discuss, which was confounder control. So if we're wanting to estimate an association between an independent variable or an exposure and a dependent variable or an outcome, um, and we want it to have any sort of causal interpretation, then we generally need to think about confounder control. So I'm, I'm sure that uh, most of you will understand exactly what I mean by a confounder, but just um, to give a very brief definition to ensure that we're all on the same page, the confounder is a variable that causes some non-causal or spurious association between an independent variable and a dependent variable. So let's think of that in terms of an exposure independent variable X and an outcome or dependent variable Y. We're interested in whether X has an effect on Y. If we observe a statistical association between X and Y, then are we happy to conclude that there's a causal association? Well, if there's a variable here, Z, um, that in this case causes itself causes X and causes Y, so it's a common cause of the two, then part of that observed association between X and Y would actually be due to the effect of Z. So it will be a spurious um, association. And so Z is what we would call a confounder. Uh, and in general, what we would want to do is account for that confounding pathway in some way, often by adjusting for that variable Z if we've observed it. So a more concrete example, if we're interested in whether drinking coffee causes cancer uh, and we observe a, a statistical association between these two variables in our data set, are we happy concluding that coffee causes cancer? Well, we might also observe that people who drink coffee also tend to be people who smoke. So you here signifies some some common cause of those. So some underlying traits, perhaps, uh, that means that those things are, are correlated with each other in our sample. And therefore, and sorry, smoking also causes cancer, as is well known. And therefore, smoking is a confounder here and we would want to adjust for it. And thankfully, as we've been hearing already, we've got very rich data collected on our cohort members over many years or in some cases decades, and these provide great opportunity for confounder control. So we're going to look at an example here from um, a published paper looking at the association of early life mental health with biomarkers in midlife and premature mortality in uh, the NCDS, the 1958 cohort. And here I'll just look at the details in terms of the biomarkers rather than mortality. So we're interested here in whether early life mental health um, is associated with or has some effect on biomarkers in midlife. So the way that our exposure here, early life mental health, is um, parameterized is in terms of conduct problems and effective symptoms. Um, there's a number of biomarkers at age 44 to 45 that are considered. I'm not going to read through these lists of variables every time. It's just an, an illustrative example, so I don't think we need to dwell on the details, but there's a number of biomarkers there. So which types of variables might we be concerned about being potential confounders in this sort of analysis? Well, there's probably characteristics to do, to do with our cohort members when they were uh, very young or at birth, characteristics to do with their parents, um, early life socioeconomic position of the cohort members themselves, and, and other early life um, characteristics of the cohort members. And these sorts of variables we collect very rich data on. So the sorts of birth characteristics that we might be interested in, there's loads and loads of these, but the list that I'm presenting here are those variables that the authors of this paper decided to control for in their analysis. Birth weight, maternal smoking during pregnancy, maternal age, etc. Lots of information on parental characteristics, uh, on early life socioeconomic position, uh, observed across a number of different domains and also of, uh, cohort member characteristics. And so these things were uh, adjusted for in the analysis um, in an, an, an attempt to control for potential confounding as much as possible. Um, so this is a, you know, a fairly typical type of analysis that will be undertaken with cohort data. Um, and a reason that people often do this type of analysis in this type of data set is that we've got these very rich data um, that provide great opportunity for confounder control. 
So another feature that's already been mentioned of the cohort studies is that we often have repeated measures of the same thing broadly um, across the different sweeps or the different waves of data collection within each cohort. So this is a, a feature that I guess is quite consistent across this type of uh, data collection. Um, and if, even if we don't have information using exactly exactly the same measurement at each time. Perhaps we've got something that's broadly comparable because it's measuring the same construct. So uh, with a little bit of work, we can we can still think about the kind of the repeated measures, the longitudinal nature of that. So uh, examples of the, the different domains in which we have these sorts of repeated measures, so physical or anthropometric measurements, weight, height, etc. Uh, across a number of different health measurements, so self-reported physical health measurements, mental health, specific diseases and conditions and different health behaviours, um, diets, physical activity, drinking, smoking, that sort of thing. Uh, relationships, marital status, household composition, we tend to um, ask questions about it every wave of data collection, so we've got very rich data there. And similarly, really, employment status, occupation, earnings and income. So you can see there's um, you know, quite a broad range of different types of variables there that could potentially be used in a, a number of different uh, types of analyses that you could be interested in. And the benefit of having these repeated measures is that it allows us to characterize changes in these variables or to model the trajectories of these variables over time. And that can be of interest for a number of different reasons. There might be some uh, kind of interest in uh, the trajectories in and of themselves, you know, whether things are going up or down for, for people across different subgroups, perhaps. Um, but also will often be um, trying to characterize these trajectories to use either as exposure variables or outcome variables in subsequent analyses. And we'll have a look at an example where that's the case. So this is uh, a fairly recent paper that I was involved in, um, looking at patterns of eczema activity uh, from birth through to midlife in NCDS and BCS70. Um, so there's a number of different measures of eczema, I think six in NCDS and nine in BCS70 between early childhood and midlife. And these are a combination of both parent reported at the younger ages and self reported at the older ages. The aim in this paper was to identify subtypes of patterns or subgroups, typologies of eczema based on the patterns of disease that are observed across these two cohort studies. So this is an example where perhaps there's some interest in these different subtypes in and of themselves, but then we were using these to further go on and examine whether early life risk factors are associated with these eczema subtypes, and also whether these eczema subtypes are associated with subsequent atopic diseases and general health in mid-adulthood. So the subtypes themselves are both exposures and outcomes in different subsequent analyses. So I won't explain the modeling approach that's used here, um, but the results um, I will briefly talk through. So on the left, we have the results for NCDS and on the right for BCS 70. Within each figure, there's age on the X axis and the predicted probability of having eczema on the Y axis. So the, uh, the four different colored lines represent four different eczema um, patterns or um, uh, you know, grouping subtypes. Um, and so in each, you'll see that there's a line that the majority of the cohort members are in very close to the, the X axis, indicating that it rare or no presence of atopic eczema. There's a line quite high and fairly consistent, one that's increasing and one that's decreasing. So it's allowing us to, to um, split up the, the sample into those different groups for subsequent analysis. So really the, the key points here is that we've got repeated observations in lots of different measurements and constructs that can be used in these different ways, particularly to characterise changes or trajectories over time. The final thing that I wanted to talk about was the potential for cross cohort analysis. So, in fact, this has already been touched on in in the majority, if not all of the um, analyses that I've discussed. So thinking about how we can analyze data from more than one of these cohorts at the same time in order to make meaningful comparisons between the cohorts. So this really allows us to extend our hypotheses. So 
thinking more now about how do things change over time or between cohort studies. So there's kind of cohort effects. So if we're wanting to make comparisons between these different cohort studies um, and we want to be able to do so in a, in a meaningful and reliable way, then we'd ideally want to be analysing identical measures across cohorts. And so for some of these different um, things that we might be interested in, and perhaps for just a, a subset of the ages at which we observe them, this is exactly what we have. We're using very similar measurement approaches. So asking exactly the same question, using the same battery of questions to, um, to calculate a, a score, or perhaps um, we will be using this, a similar sort of measurement approach. So if it's someone's height and it's it's a fairly uh, reliable approach that we're doing, that we're uh, using to measure people's height if we're actually measuring it in, per, in person. If we don't have absolutely identical measures, then we do need to think a bit how measures can best be harmonised across cohorts. And I think this has been mentioned already. So for some of the variables that we have in the cohorts, there's been programmes of work um, that have been harmonising the, these measures across the cohorts. So those harmonised versions are already available. And for others, there might be you know, more work or consideration at least that's needed by individual researchers. So the... Um, Example um, study that I'm going to present here is a paper that was looking at socioeconomic inequalities in childhood and adolescent BMI, weight and height, but I'll, I'll just concentrate on the, the BMI results here from 1952 to 2015. So this is an analysis across four uh, of the cohort studies. So it's NCDS, BCS70, MCS plus uh, NSHD that I mentioned before, born in 1946. So the idea here was to investigate how socioeconomic inequalities in childhood and adolescent weight, height and BMI have changed over time. There's a number of different measures of BMI in each of these cohorts, two or three within each. Childhood socioeconomic position um, was derived based on the father's occupational social class, which was reported at age 10 or 11 in each of these cohorts. So again, nice and, and consistently observed across the different cohorts. Um, and the authors examined association between childhood socioeconomic position and BMI to try and uh, assess socioeconomic inequalities. Um, it's also interesting whether these inequalities are widening or narrowing uh, across time and across age. So the paper presents a number of different analyses, including lots of regression modelling, but I'm going to present this figure from the paper because I think it allows us to really think about some of the um, advantages that we have from this type of cross cohort analysis. So we've got age here on the X axis, BMI on the Y axis. The, the lines in the four different colours represent the four different cohort studies. Uh, and within each of those, the dashed line represents those of the lowest social class and the solid line those of the highest social class. So it looks like a quite a simple figure, really, but there's lots going on here that we can unpick and we can make comparisons in a variety of different ways. So looking at a single line, so within a cohort and within a social class group, we can see whether BMI tends to change over age. If we compare the two different lines, so the dashed line and the solid line within one of the cohort studies, so two lines of the same colour, then we can look at one point in time cross-sectionally and say, at a given age, uh, do we observe differences in BMI according to social class? And we can also compare the slopes of those two lines. So we can say that as these cohort members age, um, is this inequality, this social inequality in, in BMI increasing or decreasing? We can also make comparisons across the cohorts, so comparing the same uh, lines representing the same social class group, but within different cohorts. We can see for a given age, so again looking cross-sectionally, uh, for a given age, do we observe differences in BMI according within these different uh, cohorts? So are there cohort effects? And then we can also go further to compare the slopes of the lines across the cohorts, and that's what really helps us identify whether this social inequality in BMI is increasing or decreasing over time. So there's there's lots to unpick there. And I think that really highlights some of the opportunities um, that there, there are in this type of analysis. And here it allowed the authors to draw conclusions like this. There was little inequality in childhood BMI in the 1946 to 70 cohorts, whereas inequalities were present in the 2001 cohort, widened from childhood to adolescence in the 1958 and 2001 cohorts. 
So the key message here is really that if we are looking to conduct these sorts of analyses across multiple cohorts, then we can extend our hypotheses and think, how do things change over time or between cohorts? And if you're interested in this type of cross cohort work, then we've got a, a recent paper that was published in Discover Social Health and Science that you might be interested in, in checking out that goes into some of the, the issues and the solutions to them in this setting. Um, so I've given you know a very, very quick overview of a small number of the different types of analyses that could be undertaken. Obviously, with very rich uh, data resources like this, there's enormous amounts of possibility. But if you're interested in seeing what other people have um, been doing over the years across these different cohort studies, then on the CLS website, we have a, a bibliography, um, a searchable database of over 5,000 publications across the cohort studies. And so you can see, see the types of analyses that, that people typically undertake. Um, OK, thank you very much. Thank you. So um, thanks, Richard and Morag. And hopefully uh, that's whetted your appetite in terms of uh, being able to using the data. So now I'm going to give you um, to look at how you get started with the data um, and also uh, look at things like things that you need to think about. So um, study design and sample weights, non-response nutrition very briefly, and then where to go for more information. So, um, yeah, so there's a wealth of resources available to help you on the um, CLS website. There are various guides, reports, documentation, um, and dictionaries, some of which have already been mentioned. Um, if you're interested in a particular cohort, for example, uh, we would advise you looking at the study user guides um, as a first port of call because they have um, a lot of information on that, and there are some that are uh, sweep specific, as for, for example. Um, there are questionnaires available online, and that's another good way to look at what's actually um, available and also the exact question wording and routing. Um, there's also additional um, also additional information, documentation, outlining coding, uh, derived variables, um, and also, in some cases, there are technical reports. So, for example, the fieldwork agencies that we use, they have uh, technical reports outlining the fieldwork and the sampling that, what, that went on, and also the things like piloting. Uh, we have data dictionaries, which are also really useful, um, as well as cohort profiles. And um, as uh, Morag, I think, mentioned, um, looking at previous papers um, are, are, are a good way to look at how the data has been dealt with and how various um, constructs have uh, have been formed. So um, when you go to the UK Data Service, um, which is actually where you will download the data, and I'll talk about a bit more about that in a minute, um, some of the resources I've already mentioned are also available here to look at before you access the data. Um, so user guides, technical reports, etc. Um, and when you um, download your data, um, you'll also get a PDF and Excel file with all these resources in it, which is um, very useful. So that that's somewhere else you can go for the information. Um, and just to say that most of our um, the cohort data is available via the UK data service.ac.uk. It's free to download for students, um, academics, um, government analysts and um, the third sector. Um, and as we've shown, um, there is a wide range of data available. And this data goes um, through a process of classification uh, based on sensitivity and disclosure um, and is grouped into low, moderately and the most sensitive and disclosive data. And most of our data um, has been classified as low level of sensitivity and disclosure. And this is licensed under um, an end user license. Um, and so in this scenario, um, your application is authorised directly by the UK Data Service and you can download directly from there. Um, other data which is under special licence, um, so this is moderately disclosive. Um, so, for example, things like more specific geographical indicators or sensitive data like mortality data or more specific detailed physical and mental health information. Um, this is um, available under special license and the most sensitive data or disclosive is available under secure access license. Um, so, for example, things like linked health data. Um, so. 
in the following example I'm going to do, we outline how to access most of the data, which, as I mentioned, falls under end user, lic end user license. And you can find out more about um, how to access uh, the other more sensitive data on the CLS website. There are various different routes, which uh, it would take me a while to go through. Um, but it's best to look at that um, on the link below. Um, but if you want to use this data, remember, you'll need to build in time for approval and training um, when necessary. So um, you'll need to register to look at the data if you haven't already for other data. Um, otherwise, um, if you have registered, you can just log in. If you um, So click on the um, log in um, on the, on the right-hand corner. Uh, if you're not, um, basically, and then, and then you will, um, type in your organization into the, into the gap there. And as you can see, um, it already recognized me, um, as being at UCL. Um, if not, uh, your organization will, hopefully will come up. Um, and then you can log in with your usual, your usual username and password for your organization. Um, obviously particularly relevant to, um, academia here. Um, if, when you can, you'll then be asked to complete a registration form with your details, selecting other options as required. And then you'll need to agree to the end user license, which outlines the terms and conditions, um, of use of service. Um, so then you'll click, uh, register, um, and once this is complete, you'll be able to download your data within sort of five, five, ten minutes, uh, which is amazing. Um, if you're not on the list, then um, then you, the process is slightly different. You'll need to click on um, my org organization's not listed uh, box and complete the application form to request um, a username and then and then go via um, a different process. So in terms of um, accessing um, the four cohorts directly, um, there are links there, and I suggest that you, you go via this route rather than searching by cohort name, for example, because um, there, are, there are many, many data files uh, related to each of the cohorts, and this, and this kind of um, groups it quite, quite nicely for you to look at. So here's an example for the Millennium Cohort Study, which is the, uh, the bottom uh, link. And you'll get into this screen, which uh, is entitled Millennium Cohort Study. So if you click on access data, um, you'll get um, this nice grouped data. Uh, so if you clicked on GN3359, which is which is the main sweeps, it'll list um, all the main sweeps of data as, um, as, as shown here on the right hand side. And um, a list of files with all the serial numbers. And today uh, I'm, I've decided that I'm interested in the, the latest uh, Millennium Cohort Sweep, so Sweep um, 7, so I've clicked on that. And I've also clicked on something called a Longitudinal Family File, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So I've selected those. Um, and then you'll need to um, assign your data to a project, if um, so either one that's already existing, if you've already logged in, or create a new project. And you'll need to put in a title, um, the type of work that it is, um, in the main, hopefully, um, in the main, it'll be non-commercial, um, abstract. So um, write a short abstract of, of 100 characters or more. Uh, um, and then before downloading the data, you'll need to click on a request access, click on complete actions, agree to, again, to the EUL, the end user license, uh, and read and agree, agree some extra conditions. And you can get the data in different formats, SPSS data or tab um, delim delimited. Um, and yeah, and then you then you can get the data. So um, if you get stuck, there's a lot of information available on the UK DS website. Um, I would um, go there. So uh, you've now uh, downloaded your data, uh, and this is an example of the age 25 data set for next steps. And you'll see there are um, a number of different files uh, containing a range of information from you've got your main interview, uh, which has got modules uh, one to seven. You've also got additional data uh, on things like um, partnerships, uh, children, household members, employment histories. And you'll also notice um, there's a derived um, variable file um, at the bottom, which is um, these, this is data that's already been constructed for you. So which includes things like uh, number, in, number of people in the household, um, employment status, uh, social class, um, highest education to date, uh, and things like um, total scores for a variety of, of, of various constructs that, that we ask um, about. Um, so moving on now to uh, structure. So in each of the cohorts, there is a, 
key uh, cohort, cohort identifier, which is uh, in column two. So if you were looking at uh, the COVID data, for example, that, that would be um, the identifier for, for the cohort. Um, and then there's in each of the um, cohorts, as it's shown in column three, so for the uh, 1958, the 1970 and next steps, um, there's a, a responder identifier um, and for that for those groups it identifies the cohort members but the millennium cohort study is slightly different um, and this identifies the family and um, these groups can uh, retain the same ID across sweeps um, and the the ID appears in the first column of the data um, and are used to um, link um, yeah, and are used to link data, uh, link data sets. Uh, and there's seven or eight characters and they start with a letter either N, B, N, S or M, depending on which, which cohort you're looking at, and are followed by numerics um, and a single uh, character. Um, sorry. So, um, and as the um, MCS, for instance, um, has other um, groups of people. Um, so, so it's because it's a family data, you'll, you need two further IDs. So you'll need to identify the cohort members, which is a, a identifier called CNUM um, and identifies singletons, twins and triplets. And then another identifier called PNUM, which um, every, basically identifies everybody else. So you need to use these to um, understand who's responding and how to merge the data. So um, the data files in the cohorts um, have different structures um, and there are two types, um, flat files and hierarchical files or flat files, which are also known as uh, wide files and hierarchical long files. So um, flat files, they have one record uh, per case or key cohort ID. Uh, and these are the main files in the 1958, the 1970 and next steps uh, and for the family files in the Millennium Cohort Study. Um, hierarchical files um, have one or more record per case or key cohort ID. So, for example, things like employment histories, time use diaries, <coughs> excuse me, or the Millennium Cohort se um, Study uh, person. So, if it's a cohort member, um, partners within family uh, files, they they will be um, long stroke hierarchical files. Um, so if I just show you um, this, this is a made up example. So you can see um, the ID for the, um, the BCS uh, 70 in the, in the first column. And in the, uh, the next column, you have sex and then you have country and then you have um, employment there, uh, MP1, MP2, MP3. And this is an example of a flat file or a wide, wide file. Um, the next example is of a hierarchical file. Um, or a long file, and this is exactly the same data, but presented in a different format. Um, so uh, you can see, for example, that the first um, uh, BCS uh, 70 record there ending in A, um, originally in the flat file, it had three three columns, and now it's actually got three, um, three rows representing the different um, employment histories. Um, and just for another example, for example, the ID ending in B and E, they've only got one row because there was only one employment record um, and C and D have two rows. So that's the difference between um, different files. Um, and then moving on to merging data very rapidly uh, within and across sweeps. So um, you'll need to identify the appropriate files uh, having initially thought, OK, well, what, what's my target population? and establishing the number of cases in the target population that you want to uh, merge together. Uh, you need to check the file structure versus hierarchical and transform it depending on which, which uh, whether you want um, the data to be wide or long. Um, you need to identify your merging variables. And as I mentioned, um, unique key uh, cohort ID, uh, member or family, for example, or other IDs, depending on the merge. And just to um, say, uh, just to be a little careful because uh, some of these are, are case sensitive. So um, um, just to look out for that um, and then check, obviously check uh, that it's merged correctly. Um, 
And to help you with this, um, uh, I would direct you to a guide, that, a data handling guide written for the Millennium Cohort Study, which has syntax in R, Stata and SPSS. Um, and the MCS is probably the most complex in terms of merging, but um, a lot of the ideas, um, or, um, although, although it will be slightly different syntax because of, um, uh, of variable names, etc., it's a good, good place to look um, if you want to have a look at um, how to merge the data. Um, okay, so there are a number of areas that you should think about uh, in your work um, using the cohort. So the first um, is, is study design and sample population. And I've put this all on one slide to try and highlight um, the differences uh, and similarities and differences between the cohorts. So one of the first things to understand is the populations the study are, studies are representative of. Uh, and how the study design then relates to that population and sample. So if you remember um, the 1958 and the 1970 cohorts, they were all born uh, in Great Britain in a particular week. So that's uh, the original uh, population. Um, and the original sample is the same um, because most, most of the total population, 95 to 98%, which were actually captured, we actually managed to capture them that, in that target week. So for those two cohorts, there are no design weights. For Next Steps and the Millennium Cohort Study, it's a bit more complex as the population covers a longer period of time. So for Next Steps, um, they represent a population of young people in 2004 and the Millennium Cohort Study um, at age nine months uh, living in the UK from 2000 to 2002. So you can imagine to capture everyone during that period would have been extremely impractical, costly and virtually impossible. Um, so in both cohorts, the sample is a subset of the population. So Next Steps uh, uses a two stage probability sampling, uh, the first stage being schools, uh, selecting schools and then pupils within schools. And then the Millennium Cohort Study is um, area of residence and disproportionately stratified by country, uh, disadvantage um, and ethnic ethnicity in England. Uh, and these are often referred to as um, complex um, survey designs. So the main design weights in the next steps, um, the principal sampling unit is schools. And as I mentioned, the strata is pupils within schools. For the MCS, um, the PSUs are areas of residence, the electrical wards and strata um, in the UK countries, disadvantaged areas and ethnicity. And there's a file available in um, both the next, next steps and um, the MCS, which includes the weight variables. And they are, and if you remember, I downloaded for the Millennium Cohort Study, the longitudinal family data file, uh, and they um, have all the weight variables in there. And if you're actually interested uh, in using uh, the weights, I would advise reading the documentation on the design and weights carefully in the user guides before you do. <clears throat> so the other thing you might want to think about is non-response and attrition. So in longitudinal studies, uh, attrition it, it's a it's a fact um it's not just it's not just our cohorts it's not it's not it's not it, all studies people will um leave the studies and um not not uh, not come back and it will happen regardless of any procedures uh that you use to minimize it and uh as i said earlier we we try really hard to keep our respondents um unit non-response so uh, it might not actually be permanent so you might find uh, that people uh for example might um select back into the study so they might uh, might have been um might have been uh there at sweep uh one um and then and then not at two and three and then might come back um so that's something um that you need to think about um item non-response in these studies tends to be um so that's not actually answering particular questions uh, it tends to be less of an issue in the cohorts um so just to make uh, it clear that obviously missing data can be a risk to representativeness uh because uh particular people were, were um it could bias since respondents are often they're systematically different from from non-respondents but not always so um what do you do about this um so there are a number of uh, things you can do. Uh, the first, which uh, we wouldn't really advise, is uh, case-wise deletion. So basically ignoring everybody, uh, non-response. So people who didn't, um, who didn't, uh, who didn't um, 
who are now missing. Uh, and this would be okay. And uh, this wouldn't be okay unless they're missing completely at random. Uh, so this would mean basically deleting anybody from the analysis if they're missing. Um, and it's straightforward, but it doesn't deal with a non-response bias. Um, you could use non-response weights, which are available in those files that I mentioned earlier. Um, or uh, you can use other more advanced methods, um, such as multiple imputation. And just to say that there is a handling missing data in the National Child Development Study and in, in some of the other studies. So, so this would be a good place to look because that goes through um, how to do this. And there's also um, a training video uh, on handling missing data in the British birth cohort. So that I would advise you to look at that if you're um, interested in using um, different, different strategies. So uh, that was a whistle stop tour. Um, so um, in terms of where you go for more information, there are a number of resources available. Uh, Closer, they provide training resources uh, for students and early career researchers uh, conducting longitudinal research. They also have a learning hub, which contains various information. Uh, there's a demonstration video um, and learning modules on different things like introduction to longitudinal studies, uh, data harmonization, analyzing longitudinal data. Another resource is the National Centre for Research Me Methods, and they run training courses throughout the year on various different methodologies. Um, they're really good. I've been on quite a few of those. Um, but they also have videos and online resources on a range of topics, including different types of analysis techniques, etc. Uh, there's also the UK Data Service, which I mentioned a lot. Um, they have a learning hub um, with useful online resources. Um, including videos on introduction to longitudinal data, survey weights and complex surveys. Um, and last but definitely not least, the CLS website has extensive resources and information um, on the cohorts. Each of the studies has an overview um, of the study, each of the sweeps um, and sub-studies, uh, documentation, latest research, and it's a great place to start. There's also um, an introduction video for each of the cohorts uh, if you want to look at one in, in particular or just interested in them, <laughs> um, along with, as I've mentioned and we've all mentioned, uh, the user guides for each, um, each study and in some cases uh, technical reports, um, questionnaires, um, etc. And we also have a training and support page on our website. Uh, where you can find previous webinars on, as, as Morag mentioned, on various uh, variety of topics, um, introductions to specific enhanced data, subject themes and more. Um, and you can search also for upcoming events. And we run a wide range of events throughout the year. So next, next Tuesday, um, which I know some of you have probably signed up for, but if you're interested, um, Next Tuesday, between 12 and 2, we have an introduction to longitudinal data, structure and visual, visualization. So going into a bit more depth on that. Um, in early February, we have a webinar on aging in the British cohort studies. Um, so types of aging measures and content in our cohorts and types of research done and will be done. Um, in the spring, a webinar on genetic data in our cohorts. Um, and later in the spring, um, more details on uh, cross cohort analysis, the paper that um, that Richard mentioned, um, the guys who wrote that will be um, will be uh, doing a webinar on that. Um, so uh, yeah, so please uh, visit our training page. And yeah, just to say we've we've covered um, an introduction to birth cohorts, uh, some of the content in the CLS cohorts, examples of the types of analysis, uh, getting started with the data, and where to go for more information. And just to say that the cohorts are an amazing resource for the research, and we hope that this webinar has given you a flavour of what you might be able to do in your own research um, and how to get going. So